Okay, welcome everyone and thank you for joining the second webinar of Carl's Inclusive Collection series, Diversity Statements and Collection Policies, which has been organize, organized by Carl's Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Working Group. Uh, I'm Julie Mora, a Senior Program Officer at Carl. Uh, before we begin, please note that simultaneous translation into French and English is available for this session and can be accessed using the interpretation icon in the bottom right corner of your Zoom window. Uh, une traduction simultanée en français et en anglais est disponible pour cette session et est accessible via l'icône d'interprétation dans le coin inférieur droit de votre écran. I'd like to start by acknowledging that today's speakers and attendees are joining us from the unceded territories of many Indigenous peoples. Uh, my home and the Carl office, located here in Ottawa, uh, are built on unceded Algonquin Anishinaabe territory. We welcome you to add your own acknowledgements into the chat and to honor and recognize the ongoing contributions of the First Peoples of these lands. I'd also like to take this opportunity to go over the logistics for the session. So links to the Carl Code of Conduct have been included at the beginning of the chat thread and organizers of this webinar are committed to providing a welcoming, professionally engaging and safe experience. If you have any questions or concerns, please contact Susan Haig, Carl Executive Director, whose content information has also been listed in the chat. Uh, our speakers will be taking questions at the end. You may ask questions in French or English, either by entering them into the chat or by raising your hand when prompted. Uh, finally, auto-generated captions have been enabled for this webinar, which is being recorded. Now I'd like to invite our speakers to introduce themselves and lead our discussion today. Thank you very much, Julie. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our session called Diversity Statements in Collection Development Policies. Um, I'm Catherine Lachain. I will be joined with my colleague, uh, Brian and Marta today. We're gonna do a quick introduction in a minute. Um, we can go to the next slide. Um, I know that Julie just uh, did her own acknowledgement, but we would like to add our, our, our own. So we would like to acknowledge that the land on which this research was done is the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin, Anishinaabe, and Anishinaabe peoples. We embrace that these lands are now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples, and hope that the work we do helps libraries take steps towards reconciliation and honors the land and its Indigenous heritage. Um, so quickly, the team, so Marta um, from the uh, St. Paul uh, University, so she's Collection Development and Liaison Librarian. She's also the, the lead uh, of this project. Um, I'm Catherine, I'm o the Open Education Librarian uh, in an interim position right now at the University of Ottawa Library. And we're joined with Brian Rivado, who's uh, newly the cell representative uh, sales manager in Canada at Paradigm Publishing Services. Um, this project is supported by St. Paul University Internal Research Funding. Um, and one thing that we also wanted to add, um, you can see we're all <laughs> white people. Um, so we, um, um, we want to mention that um, we are not you know, um, the kind of representatives of leaders of this conversation. Um, so we want to acknowledge the privilege uh, we have to have to undertake this research as white settlers, cisgender and able individuals. Uh, so we recognize that this is a sensible topic. Um, and again, that we're not the representatives or leaders of this discussion. So we welcome any comments, concern, questions from uh, today's participants, but it was important to acknowledge that. Um, so um, quickly, what we'll do today uh, during uh, this session, so we'll talk about this project. So this is uh, based on the research project that we um, und undertook maybe not two years ago now. Um, we'll talk, we'll do a brief, brief uh, literature review on the topic, talk about our methodology, and then the bulk of our session will be on the study results and also discussion. Um, so now I uh, will give the mic to Marta. So we will ask you to work a little bit with us. So we'll have several interactions during the session. So this is our first one. This is is using Slido. So you can join it um, either through slido.com and enter the number you see on the screen, or you can scan the QR code that you see and vote this way. So the first question is, are you involved in collection development decisions at your institutions? 
So we'll give you a few seconds uh, to vote and we'll have several of the slider uh, interactions throughout the session. So again, please scan the QR code if you have a phone handy, or you can go to slido.com and enter the numbers 2275159. Okay, we have about 20 people who have voted already. We'll give it a little bit, a few more minutes. Okay, so we have about 50 to 50% 50 of our participants involved directly with the selecting and acquiring materials. That's great to hear. Um, we have several, 25%, who oversee the collection development process but don't selecting materials themselves. 11% provide input or recommendations. And then we have 7% in both categories where people do not, are not involved in collection development at all. Thank you so much for voting. This is great. So this allows us to actually know our audience and um, it's great to have you all here. So why did we decide to do this research? Uh, in 1930, Francis Drury established 21 book selection principles, and one of which states that the high purpose of book selection is to provide the right book for the right reader at the right time. Uh, this principle closely equals how we do collection development today. However, is this enough? Academic libraries are often described as a beacon of diversity and inclusion. For example, Cruz in 2019 stated that diversity is a cornerstone of the library profession. As libraries navigate in a society that is inherently racist, unjust, and oppressive, it is crucial to critically examine libraries' collection policies and practices, and whether these policies and practices contribute to inequality, marginalization, and injustice. In fact, this active and critical self-reflection is essential to combat um, the um, path of a neutrality. The process of decolonizing library collection is essential to also combat traditional Eurocentric fo focus by focusing on intentionally acquiring materials. Thus, this research stems from the pressing need to understand e and how collection development policies of academic libraries in Canada represent the EDAI language and how it aligns with the professional practice of academic librarians. Before we proceed, we wanted to um, we wanted to uh, excuse me define the EDAI language. And so we have adopted the definitions provided by uh, Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. Uh, so um, the, here you can see the definition of equity, diversity, and inclusion as provided by Shirk. And in addition, we also included the definition of indigenization decolonization from the Pulling Together BC Campus Guide to Decolonization by Cool and Colleagues. And so um, in, uh, I'm not going to read all of this definition, but you can have them on the slide. But I wanted to acknowledge that we will be using EDI and EDII language interchangeably because many institutions do not have mentioned if of indigenization when they talk about EDI. And other terms that we have found in the literature literature are GEDI, IDEA, DEII, DID, and all of them are going to be used uh, interchangeably in this presentation. When it comes to collection development and based on the definitions of EDII concepts, we would like to establish what does EDII means in collection development. So it means building library collections with a consistent consideration of multiple voices from the community, taking into account race, color, ethnic origin, immigration status, social status, religious views, gender, gender expression, sexual orientation, age and physical learning abilities, etc 
by providing equitable access and representation of these voices in order to include users' needs as the focal point of the collection and dismantle colonial ideologies. But why do we do look at the collection development policies? So first, before we proceed, let's define collection development. So collection development is a systematic assessment of selection and deselection of the library resources. It helps library staff uh, to meet collection goals as they relate to the mission of the library. And it also informs the library's clientele about the principles by which materials are selected for inclusion. Uh, those of you who do collection development uh, know that we operate based on relevance of the resources to the curriculum, currency, and anticipated use. The policies play an important role in our practice as well. Um, so according to Carmark 2021, policies establish priorities and command practice. So it is imperative that libraries take on collection development of uh, take on the development of diversity, equity, and inclusion in their collection development policies. So based on this, our research question for this project was, how do collection development policies of academic libraries in Canada reflect the elements of the EDII framework? Now we're going to talk a little bit about the literature review findings. Oui, donc une très, très brève recension euh, de la littérature, donc quelques constatations euh, qu'on a eues lorsqu'on fouillait. Okay, go to next slide. Euh, donc, vraiment les, les concepts fondamentaux qu'on qu retrouve euh, dans cette littérature-là sont la justice sociale, l'inéquité, euh, marginalisation. Désolée, j'ai eu un pop-up. Euh, unité, marginalisation, injustice et décolonisation. Donc, on sait que la littérature scientifique sur les concepts d'équité, diversité et inclusion est de plus en plus abondante. Euh, mais dans le contexte du développement de, euh, de politique ou du développement de collection des bibliothèques, c'est encore un sujet qui est très émergent. Vous allez noter les dates de parution de nos art des articles qui sont cités ici euh, sont très récents. Donc, euh, dans la littérature actuelle, euh, il est entendu que la question de l'EDI, l'EDIA, donc pour autorisation, euh, dans le développement de, euh, des collections de bibliothèques, est une question de justice sociale, donc comme Kidney et Al euh, le mentionnent. Donc, il est essentiel d'examiner de manière critique les politiques et pratiques de développement de collections de bibliothèques et de déterminer si ces politiques et pratiques donc, en parenthèse ici, contribue à l'inégalité, la marginalisation et l'injustice euh, de groupes, de certains groupes. Euh, une idée récente, euh, vraiment, c'est celle de la décolonisation des collections de bibliothèques. Donc, euh, Bloom et Voylands, en 2020, affirment qu'il s'agit vraiment d'un travail nécessaire, donc primordial, pour combattre une focalisation traditionnellement eurocentrique des collections en se concentrant sur l'acquisition intentionnelle, donc vraiment intentional, euh, donc de, de documents. Une publication récente de Jones euh, et Al, euh, et, et contributeurs, suggère que les pratiques évoluent vers une inclusion plus, encore une fois, intentionnelle et euh, qui va au-delà des voies blanches et vers un... Donc, vraiment, qu'on qu se concentre à euh, mieux comprendre les besoins de nos communautés qui sont très diversifiées sur nos campus. Donc, pour mettre en œuvre cette décolonisation-là... Euh, il faut faire, donc une des suggestions qui est dans la littérature, c'est de faire des audits, donc vraiment des examens de nos collections actuelles pour, pour nous permettre de, de, de comprendre nos collections, mais aussi euh, juste d'affirmer, de, de réaffirmer qu'elles sont peut-être justement eurocentriques, très blanches, euh, très euh, peu diversifiées. Donc, euh, l'importance d'un cadre EDI dans euh, les pratiques et les politiques de développement de collection euh, est réaffirmée euh, donc, dans la littérature qu'elle permet aux bibliothécaires de développer des collections euh, en prenant compte, encore une fois, de, de leurs besoins sur leur, leur campus, vraiment leur, leur population sur leur campus, sur leurs usagers, euh, qui sont maintenant de plus en plus diversifiés, comme, euh, comme on le sait. Donc, next slide. Okay, so I'm going to uh, just quickly 
give an overview of uh, our project stage stages and the methods that we use to analyze the, the data that we collected. Okay, so in stage one, um, we this included an environmental scan uh, and creating a rep repository of collection development policies. So during this phase, some of the areas we investigated were whether EDII statements were present at an institutional, uh, library, or collection development uh, policy levels. Um, we also collected uh, additional data related to these institutions to create um, a snapshot of that landscape, um, such as student population, languages, that kind of thing. Um, and then during stage two, we performed a thematic uh, analysis of the collection development policies. So for this, we created a set of codes uh, and tagged relevant text within the collection development policies using um, the software in vivo. Uh, this allowed us to see the trends and relationships for specific criteria across all of the policies. So now I'm just gonna go over the study results in this section. Next slide. Uh, so yeah, first we'll do a quick overview of the environmental scan. Um, so in addition to gathering uh, the collection development policies, we harvested data about each Canadian university library and their institution. The goal here was to develop a data set that could help us answer questions regarding, um, as I mentioned, student population, location, languages of instruction, and uh, a long list of other things. Uh, when examining the data from the environmental scan, we found a significant commitment to EDI principles, um, but the main focus from the textual analysis will examine whether collection development policies are keeping pace. So next I'm going to take a minute to give a couple of examples of what we took away from this data. Uh, the aim is to illustrate the type of relationships that we hope to identify um, and ways we tried to inform the textual analysis. So is there a commitment to EDII principles at Canadian universities? Uh, the short answer is yes. Uh, at the time of the scan, we found that 76% of Canadian universities have published a statement on their website that explicitly supports EDI principles at their institutions. Um, the next image. Uh, the next uh, graph here represents the institutional EDII statements by the official language of the institution. So you'll see here that 76% of the English institutions have an EDI statement, 94% of French uh, institutions have one, and 50% of bilingual. Okay, so how often did the university uh, EDI statements mention libraries? Um, so you'll see here only two, unfortunately, of the 10, 110 universities that we examined mention libraries in their EDI statement. Um, so libraries need to explore ways to, to make their own statement. Next. Uh, so I just wanna give you those two mentions quickly. Um, so the first one, I'm not gonna read them because uh, they're right there on the screen for you, but um, what we can see is that they, in one that they mentioned uh, decolonizing the collection uh, and taking, and then also taking action uh, on the addition of indigenized subject headings. The second one from uh, University of PEI, um, they call for an increase of resources related to groups who are historically under, underrepresented in library collections. Uh, next slide. So do libraries make commitments to EDII principles? Um, some do, but not many. Uh, we found that 15 out of 110 university libraries in Canada have an EDI statement uh, on their website. This was at the time of the study. 
So when uh, cross-referencing our data, we also found an interesting correlation between EDI statements uh, on university websites and EDI uh, library statements. So from 84 universities that included an EDI I statement, 17% uh, also included an EDI statement from the library. Um, and from 26 institutions who do not have uh, an EDI university level statement, for only 4% of those libraries uh, had an EDI statement. So this indicates that organizational culture could possibly play a role in um, fostering the commitment to EDI principles uh, across the different parts of institutions. So um, EDI is a term that we came across in our research, though we did not find specific mention uh, of this complete term in any uh, of the collection development policies that we looked at. Uh, we think that especially within Canada, it would be even more impactful commitment to include uh, indigenization as part of EDI uh, statements and collection development policies. So 45% of university EDI statements that mention indigenization and 60% of library EDI statements mention uh, indigenous issues. So this points to an awareness of the need for steps towards uh, reconciliation in universities and academic libraries. And we think it would be impactful to extend this language into um, collection development policies. I think this is your slide, Marta. Thank you so much, Ryan. So to put things in the perspective, let's look at the bigger picture here. So while 79% of the higher education institutions in Canada have EDI statement on their website, 13% of institutional library statements on, uh, sorry, have separate EDI, state, uh, EDI commitment on their website. So you can see that from all the university statements in 76%, only 13% of the library statements were available. When it comes to collection and development policies, we have found only two policies, so 1.8%, that contain explicit EDI statement, but we have also found that 20% of the institutions contain references to diversity, so diversity of users and collections, equity, specifically equal access, and inclusive spaces. We also wanted to see whether they, uh, sorry, apologies. We also found a correlation between EDII language and how recently the policies were updated. As you can see from this graph, language on diversity and equity starts to become more prevalent in the collection development policy starting in around 2015. Similarly, the concept of indigenization, decolonization does not appear in policies prior to 2015. So we can see the correlation between the um, time the policy was last updated and the concept that we have discovered within the policies based on the, our textual analysis. Here we have another interaction. So we would like to ask you, what key concepts or principles do you believe should guide the integration of EDII in the collection development policies? So this is a word cloud. So if you can respond with one word or maybe you know a small phrase, um, that would be helpful. So we'll give uh, maybe two, three minutes for this interaction. have inclusive by design. Excellent, we have several communities. So communities, consultation, communities, collaboration, accessibility, intentional commitment to listening to communities. Very good um, measure, intention, expansive, sustainability. Okay, you can add more than one listening. So we see communities a lot, we see collaboration a lot. 
That's great. Best practices for long-term sustainability. That's great. <clears throat> Keep them coming. <laughs> Publisher diversity, include independent small publishers. Excellent, that, that's great. Get to know literature of the subject you collect in. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Uh, this has been really interesting to see what you think about the topic. So now we want to actually show you what themes we have discovered. Um, so let's look at those some of those findings from the thematic analysis of our collection development policies uh, of Canadian university libraries. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, during the textual analysis, we have found several major themes in collection development policies and used thematic analysis to code the themes in NVivo software. We have then applied the codes in NVivo to collection development policies we found on the following themes. Uh, so EDII, EDII, so we wanted to look at the direct mentioned that specifically use those concepts. Then we looked at the indirect mention. So any references to diversity in either languages, informants, in topics, etc. We also wanted to look at the user needs. So how do policies address the needs of the library users? Um, faculty community recommendations were included in that as well. Academic freedom, which is really interesting. I don't think it was mentioned. Um, so references to the academic freedom and bill of rights, that was really important for us as well. We looked at accessibility, so references to AODA standards and accessible collections. And then we looked also at cultural awareness, so flexibility to respond to the cultural and social needs of the university community, which closely correlated to the user needs as well. Ryan, up to you. Thank you. Um, okay, so EDI statements in collection development policies. How many um, how many make an explicit statement on EDI? Does anyone want to just pop a couple of guesses in the chat? Uh, I'm just curious what the community here might might think. How many collection development policies uh, explicitly mention EDI? And I put a note earlier, but the scan was done during the fall of 2022. Um, so the data that we're presenting now, we know that it's already a little bit outdated, but not much, but again, it's 2022, so. Yeah, so a, a, very, a very few, three, five. Um, Marta, do you want to show them how, how many it was? Absolutely, yes. Two, so yeah, very few or less is is correct so un yeah unfortunately we only found two um so those two examples are here um we can see that brandon brandon university actively seeks to include uh equitable diverse uh accessible and inclusive content uh while western uh libraries is committed to the principles of equity, diversity, and inclusion. And these were the two most um, explicit uh, commitments that we found. Uh, in these statements, we see uh, language that clearly shows that these libraries have identified the need to make commitments to EDI, um, whether that be related to material selection, community involvement, uh, or the values of the organization. Uh, we'll see that in the textual analysis that the language within the collection development policies, um, that although the individual terms of EDI are used, uh, the context is not is not the same. Next slide. Um, so in our preliminary results, uh, we'd like to focus on EDI I concepts used in the collection development policies, uh, as well share the context in which they were used. Um, thus the direct mentions within the collection development policies for equity, 
uh, we're 14 percent. That includes things like equitable access or diversity uh, in reference to students or content. That was 18 percent. Uh, inclusion, uh, in, you know, specifically inclusive spaces, that kind of thing was uh, mentioned in only 2% of collection development policies. And lastly, um, but not least, indigenization. So that could be indigenous pedagogies, uh, decolonial perspective uh, in content, that kind of thing, uh, 12, mentioned in 12% of policies. So that was the individual mentions. So here are some examples of how diversity is being incorporated into some of uh, the collection development policies that we uh, analyzed. So to promote the growth of diverse quality content in library collections uh, by collecting materials from uh, decolonial perspectives and diverse voices. Um, and a second example here is the library's mission is to provide easy access to a diverse and dynamic scholarly collection of material in support of the research, teaching, and learning at the university. Um, so it mentions that you use diversity described to describe um, voices and decolonial perspectives are, are great examples of EDI principles, but the majority of mentions uh, which reference diverse collections uh, or diverse formats, those don't really work to inform EDI practice. So uh, very few university library collection uh, development policies mention equity. Um, and when they do, it focuses on equitable access. So here's a couple of examples. The library's aim is to provide a balanced, equitable access to materials in a multi-campus environment. And a second example is the library is committed to providing equitable barrier-free access to our collection. Um, in accordance with the uh, Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act. So additionally, 45% of collection development policies from Ontario academic libraries reference the AODA. Um, and we found that accessibility has been mentioned by uh, over 30% of collection development policies that we examined. So next, uh, the term inc uh, inclusion has been directly mentioned only five times, um, and it mostly refers to inclusive spaces. So there, here's a couple of examples of that. Uh, library users will have access to library collections with no discrimination based on racialized identity, uh, gender identity or expression, cultural or ethnic background, ability, family status, age, and political or religious beliefs and views. Um, in cases such as this, we applied inclusion directly because the term inclusion was not often used, but uh, was referenced in other ways like we see in this example. Okay, um, indigenization language is related to promoting reconciliation. Uh, however, it's also underrepresented in collection development policies. Um, here's one example of indigenization. Uh, language, which talks about incorporating indigenous way of knowing into the collection development practices. So the library is dedicated to working toward reconciliation with indigenous peoples, understanding the importance of acknowledging the past and calling attention to present challenges. Um, the library commits to incorporating principles of indigenous ways of knowing into building our collections as well as the provision of library services to the wider university community. So now let's discuss a little bit how they related to the themes of EDI language in collection development policies. Oops, sorry. Um, so here we can see that uh, the mention of accessibility, Bill of Rights, academic freedom, the role of librarians, user needs. And so this has been um, confirmed in other topics uh, that I just mentioned. So uh, you can see that uh, we see a correlation between those universities that don't have EDI statements and those universities contain, that contain the EDI statements. So the difference is quite 
uh, large between both of them. And so this further confirms that there might be a possible correlation between organizational culture and EDI language across different institutional units. Donc maintenant pour notre brève conclusion. Um, donc en ce moment, avec les résultats de notre, euh, notre scan euh, et puis de notre analyse thématique, donc on voit que les politiques de développement des collections euh, dans les universités canadiennes contiennent euh, actuellement un langage très limité autour de l'équité, la diversité, l'inclusion et l'autorisation, particulièrement lorsque d'une affirmation très claire à ce sujet-là. Euh, donc, de nombreux établissements n'ont pas de politique de développement de collection de mise à jour. Ça, c'est une chose qu'on a remarqué. Um, as you might have seen from the previous slide, like, there's a lot of institutions that, um, like, the wording was not there just because it, the policies were so old. Uh, I think we, we found the oldest was, like, from 2000. Um, so that might be a reason why we don't see this language integrated. Mais, donc, euh, la, la, la date de, de publication et, euh, de la politique et le, le langage, donc une corrélation là. Euh, la plupart des déclarations de DI des universités ne mentionnent pas les bibliothèques et leurs collections, donc ça c'est une constatation qu'on fait. Euh, les politiques institutionnelles pour euh, le DI, donc il y a plus de politiques institutionnelles que euh, de déclarations EDI dans les politiques de développement de collection, donc on voit que c'est plus au niveau institutionnel, mais que les bibliothèques ou les politiques de collection n'ont pas euh, leur, leur propre déclaration. Et puis, euh, on n'a pas montré des détails là-dessus, mais il y a des facteurs aussi euh, d'influence euh, sur euh, le fait d'avoir une, une déclaration ou pas, donc la taille de l'établissement, la localisation aussi, particulièrement liée euh, au groupe autochtone, la relation, la relation avec les communautés autochtones. Donc, il y a plusieurs facteurs qui, euh, qui influencent, mais notre constat, c'est qu'il y a encore beaucoup de travail à faire. Donc, je voulais, on voulait terminer avec un, un exemple récent. Donc, comme j'ai mentionné tantôt, le scan a été fait à l'automne 2022. Depuis, euh, ben, mon université d'attache a euh, renouvelé sa politique de développement de collection, donc euh, en janvier 2024. Et puis, il y a, il y a une, des lignes directrices très claires sur, euh, sur en fait, le, le, leur engagement face à l'équité, la diversité et l'inclusion. And I know that my colleagues are on this call, so <laughs> feel free to, to add about the process. We'll have a moment for discussion. Uh, but I wanted to present that as a new um, example. Um, donc, dans la politique, uh, il est mentionné que les membres de l'équipe vont s'efforcer de développer une collection inclusive et d'adopter une approche flexible dans l'application des critères de sélection. Uh, donc, pour s'assurer que les... Uh, groupes sous-représentés soient inclus et représentés dans la collection. Et puis, il y a une recommandation, une ligne très claire par rapport à l'EDI. Euh, donc, les groupes travaillent dans les... On, on, il va y avoir des recommandations, des recherches, donc vraiment une, une pratique active pour s'assurer euh, que la collection euh, représente nos valeurs d'autochtonisation, de décolonisation, d'antiracisme, d'équité, de diversité, d'accessibilité et d'inclusion. Um, so the link is there in French, but uh, we can also share um, in English. So this is uh, publicly available online. So giving that example, uh, taking that example and keeping it in mind, we can go to the next um, slide. So um, seeing that, um, It's all great, but there's still a lot of questions and things to reflect on. Um, for example, does the practice align with the uh, EDII principle? So um, as we've just shown with well, the UOTAWA example, but also from other institutions, um, the real like ends on practice doesn't align with the EDII principle. How, um, what are the expectations regarding the use of the inclusive um, collection development policy, um, et cetera. Next, um, click. Um, 
Um, also, how do library users feel about their collection? How do you integrate the user's voice into the collection development uh, process? And we saw uh, some of you mentioned that uh, in the um, the slide though earlier, um, the community is really important, but how do we integrate their voices? Um, and also um, in terms of adapt adoption or adapting a principle or um, statement like these, um, how can the library and the librarians hold themselves accountable for inclusive collection development policies? So these are all questions that um, just to keep in mind, um, we still have time for discussion, so uh, we'll have time to, to explore them. But uh, we have one last um, slide over here. So what does an ideal inclusive collection look like uh, to you and how can we start working toward that vision? So you can uh, keep in mind the question that I just mentioned or things that we said, an example that you saw. Um, so what for you would be ideal? Also, feel free to unmute yourself if you would like to share. Yeah, dynamic, very wide ranging. It's like you sortir des sentiers battus. So, um, you know, we can be creative, um, expanding our perspective, cross cultural understandings. Yes, inspires. Yeah, not just sexy right now. <laughs> I think that's a good point. Like, um, and this is the whole purpose also of this um, of this research is like we know that EDI it's it's a la mode. It's all sexy right now. Everybody's talking about it, but really, um, even if we put a statement uh, on you know, in our policy, like in practice, like really, we need to do the work, um, the real work. We see some of these typing, we'll wait a minute and then we'll um, we'll kind of conclude and open uh, the floor for um, more you know, discussion. Because we know that a lot of you are doing collection development, so I, we probably have a lot of experience with that type of work or would like to, to learn more about others' experiences. Back into our daily work. It's an ongoing daily work, something that we need to keep in mind on a daily basis. Who benefits in an investing in collection? Right. We know it costs a lot of money, so um, yeah, not just to contact. This is all great. Thank you for sharing. Um, just as a final kind of quote again to keep ourselves thinking. Um, this is from a recent publication that I think might be of interest for a lot of you. It's uh, from uh, Jameson, uh, Decentering Whiteness in Libraries, a Framework for Inclusive Collection Management Practices. So um, again, this is this has a lot of good insight, but also you know, examples and how-to principles uh, for collection development. But um, she said, collection development policies create institutional memory. So when policies are written, they should represent a collective 
consciousness of an organization. Um, and we saw that not all universities at this point have EGI statements so have put, you know, took a stance on uh, equity, diversity, inclusion, um, and even less like you know, library and coaching development policies mentioned that. But um, if we do, like it, it represents ourself, um, it represents the organization, represent our community. Um, so keeping that in mind, I think is, is quite important. So I really like this, this quote, uh, I think it's quite inspiring. Um, yeah, powerful quote. So thank you very much um, for listening to our session. So we'll close the, the slides so we can see each other. Um, and we have still have 13 minutes to discuss, so this is great. Um, so we'll invite you and we can come back to the question that we presented earlier, or if you want to share any thoughts uh, or question about this, uh, this work, we'd be happy to, uh, to discuss. <laughs>